How is everybody? Great. I, I'm going to start before I get into any content by giving a little test. I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, and as with all things, all this information only really is any value if you apply it. And really, the big issue is, as a leader, uh, when you take all of this and you go back, how do your leadership decisions change? So uh, I'm going to take you back, wow, about, what is it now, 20, 25 years to when I was at Cambridge. So I, I, get, I went to this college here, Trinity College. It's the largest college there. I got there. I was like bright-eyed. I was an architecture student. And I got involved in rowing. And what I'm about to tell you is a story. Uh, there's been some amazing success stories this morning. This is not a success story. This is a story of failure <laughs> just reached out of the clutches of success. This is what this is. And this is a story uh, about rowing. And I'm sure some of you have heard of uh, rowing as a metaphor for leadership, for trust. You've heard that, right? You may think differently after this story. <laughs> <laughs> so I get there, and I've never rowed before. And I just get into the boat and start going. And I'm a novice, and I do fairly well in the first year, and at least the second year. And I do fairly well in the second year. And now I'm in one of the higher eights and beginning of the third year, I guess, the point where I become the captain of the first and third Trinity Boat Club, which is in Cambridge, one of the most esteemed positions and one which for me was like the very, very first leadership position I had ever been in. Well, I mean, there's a thousand uh, students in, in, in Trinity. There's uh, probably about four to five hundred of them who row. So here I am now with this group of four or five hundred people showing up on the river every morning at six in the morning, uh, and I'm the one leading all of them. And it just so happens that on the year that I am the captain, which is 1988, 1988 uh, it happens to be the 150th anniversary of the club, and it also happens to be the 150th anniversary of the Henley Regatta, where it happens that the very first boat club to ever win the Henley Regatta was Trinity. So I'm there thinking, this is going to be a very special year. And I think, how can I make it even more special? So the first thing that I do is I say, let's make sure we have the best coaches and the best crew ever, and let's go head of the river. In the, let's just make sure that we are the number one. And at that point, we're, we're a few behind from number one. We thought this was even possible. I said, how can I make it even better? And I realized that the entire constitution of the boat club had been the same for 150 years. I said, not only will this be the 150th anniversary, it'll be the first time in 150 years we'll have an entirely revamped constitution for the 21st century. And I started rewriting this constitution. I said, how can we make it even better? I thought, I'm going to call Peter Coney, who heads up the Henry Regatta, and see if it's possible for us to actually have a row over on the final day as the very, very first boat club ever. And after that first time, Trinity never won again. So we'd never got to the final day at Henley. So this would have been the first time ever in 150 years since the first time that we would be rowing over as a college crew on the final day, usually a time that's reserved for the big Olympic crews and the national crews. So I phoned Peter Coney. He said yes. And I thought, this is turning out to be an amazing year. How can I make it even better? I thought about it. And I thought, we have never gone on a tour outside of Cambridge or even outside of England ever. There's something called the Royal Canadian Henley, which is out from Canada, which happens after we do our special row over. Let's go out to that. And so I phoned up all of the old boys, the guys that could actually pay some money in to help us to have this joint off to Canada. Uh, the entire uh, first eight were just so excited about this happening, and we started actually raising the money for it as well. And we then went through the first term into the second term. We were getting better and better. We got to the third term, and we were actually now the fastest boat on the river, and it looked like we were going to achieve becoming the head of the river. And I remember going into the weekend before the bumps, which are the big races. And it's a weekend before the bumps. It's just two weekends away from Henley Regatta, and here I am in my last two weeks at Cambridge after three years, and I thought, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> okay, so something I've learned in life is that if you at any moment are at that point where you think nothing can go wrong, <laughs> everything about to go wrong. So Monday morning comes. And Rory, who happens to be a great friend, he's amazing, he's just brilliant with people, he's not so good at the details, always kind of late with regatta entries and things like that. Rory, he comes in and he goes, uh, Roger, we have a problem. I go, what? And he says, I forgot to put the entry in 
for handling. I go, Roy, I reminded you last week and you said you were going to put it in. What happened? He goes, I know, I know, I know. And I said I was going to do it. But like, you know, I'm like, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I said, we've got like two hours. This is it. We, like, how do we get down? How do we do this? And I started panicking. And I phoned up Peter Coney. And I, uh, he's the guy who runs the whole of Henley Regatta. And I said, we've got a real problem here. Because this was a long time before they were having any kind of like online uh, submissions or anything like that. We had to physically get the document down to him. And there wasn't enough time to get from Cambridge down to Henley. And I said, there's got to be some way. Like, I'm telling you now before the deadline at one o'clock that we haven't got it in. He says, Roger, I just had the Norwegian Olympic crew come and say they haven't got theirs in. I rejected them. I can't say yes to you. I said, but are you going to have us on the last day? We organized all this. He says, if you can't get your entry in, don't blame me. And he puts up the phone. So now I'm like, what? No. And I go running around for the next 90 minutes trying to figure this thing out because I realized we have all the old boys that are showing up. They're bringing all their friends. We've got uh, this big Canadian regatta happening. We've got the whole race that's about to start. I remember at about 10 minutes before the deadline, just giving up, just realizing it's not going to happen. I saw my entire three years of Cambridge, which had come to this culminating point, and we had gone out shouting like crazy about what we were going to be achieving in the next week, just come collapsing down. And I went out past the, uh, uh, past the college onto the other side of the camp. There's like a bench there where you sit down and you can see the Trinity uh, Library, which is uh, that library there. And um, I just sat there thinking, where did I go wrong? Was it because I trusted Rory and I shouldn't have been trusting him? Should I have been checking that he actually got it in even though I reminded him? Then I started thinking, what am I going to tell everybody? Do I tell the crew now, honestly, that we're actually not going to Henley after all the build-up, and then I'm going to actually demotivate them from this week when we've actually got the races? Do I hide it from them, and then we have the races, and hopefully we still get to the head of the river, but then I'm going to tell them, and then they're going to say, you should have told us earlier. Do I say to anyone it was Rory who did it, or do I tell them as a leader and as a captain it was my responsibility? What do I do? Where does trust fit into all of this, and how are people going to trust me? Take a moment, because this is what I was grappling with as a young 20-year-old with no answers. And take a moment with the person next to you, and just tell them what you would have done. Take a moment, have a conversation. <laughs> so now that you, and you've probably noticed that in that conversation, you, whatever you thought you might have done, you probably found there's other opinions. Other people would do different things. So what did I do? Uh, realizing that I was on the other side of the cam, which meant I wasn't close to anybody, I crept out the back and ran away. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I went to the boat club, and I spent an hour phoning up all of the people that had sponsored us and said that they were going to be coming and told them that me and my team had made an awful error and that we had not got that entry in. Uh, I didn't get any popularity marks that day from any of them, but I kind of just sucked it up and I said that. And I said to the team the day before the races, I'm sorry, guys, but we're not going to Henley. We didn't get the entry in on time. I didn't blame Rory for it. I said, I'm taking this on myself. You know, I should have worked it out. I'm sorry. And then after having had the worst day ever, we went down to the river the next day. The crew fell apart. We didn't go to the head of the river. In fact, we ended up going down. That was the worst rowing we had. That whole week, you have to do it four days in a row. And after the first day, when we were just rowing the worst we'd ever rowed, we tried to pick it up on the second day, and we couldn't. We tried to pick it up on the third day and the fourth day, and we couldn't. We got to the end of the week, and we had sponsors saying they wanted their money back. We had the, uh, the crew totally in disarray. Uh, I had people sending me hate messages because I had actually uh, built up such uh, an, an image of us having success, which had all come down on my watch. And I got to the Friday. And I remember thinking at that point, this just simply could not get any worse. <laughs> One thing I've learned in life <laughs> is if you ever get that point where you think things cannot get any worse, 
they always do. <laughs> it just so happened that on the Sunday, we had our elections for the coming year. And uh, while Roy was leaving, because he's in his last year just like me, Pete Citroen, who was the company secretary and someone who I really loved, he was in the crew, he was a fantastic guy, he was putting himself up for captaincy. We had someone else, Alex Barrett, who had actually left for the boat, uh, uh, for the blue boat, and he'd rode there for a year and he was coming back, and he hadn't really spent much time around, but a lot of people liked him too, and he was also up for vote. And I remember uh, we were there, and I was the one adjudicating, and we had them both come in, and we had the whole, everyone showed up, just like you're showing up here, and they both had their talk about, you know, what they'd like to do, how they'd like to do it. Uh, I had Mark Littlewood, who uh, was one of the people in the, the crew who'd come out and said, Roger, I'm not going to be around, but look, here's my vote. I'm voting for Pete. I said, great, fantastic. And then he left as well. And then everyone who showed up, they were all there. And after they showed up, Pete and Alec went for a walk. They walked down uh, while everyone had a chance to then consider. And I said, would anyone like to share anything about any final words? And a few people got up and they said some things for Alex. And some people got up and they said some things for Pete. Uh, and then it was me at the end. And I thought, am I going to say something or am I not? And that was a decision. Do I say something? Do I not say something? Do I just leave it to everybody else? And I made the decision that I would just share how I felt. And I said, you know, guys, just so you know how I felt, because this is what I care about more than anything, this club, and I really want to make it be successful, and both of them would be great as captains. But my feeling is Pete would make a better captain, because I've known Pete for the year, and these are the reasons that I feel he'd be better, but you make your decision. And after I made that decision, I went next door, and everyone put in their votes, and as those votes came through, the door knocks, and a group show up, and they said, Roger, you did totally the wrong thing. It is not for you to be telling other people who they should vote for in this point. And I thought about it, and I thought, but surely even presidents do that when they're actually bringing the next president in. Why could I not do that? And then at that moment, when they actually brought the numbers in, the crew that was there who was saying this was the wrong thing to do, they saw the people who were counting it come in, and they said, it's a dead heat. It's a dead heat. And I was now there in front of everybody thinking, well, what do I do? And as I'm thinking that, I put my hand in my pocket. And I feel Mark's vote. And I bring the vote up and I said, oh, wait, I've got one more. This is from Mark Littlewood. This one's for Pete. I guess Pete gets it. And at that moment when I said that, this group just went crazy and they went out and I left there and the guys that went out and told Pete and Pete came back and he accepted. And at that moment, Pete then went off. And then as I sat there, the whole group came back and they said, Roger, what you did was totally wrong. We don't trust you one piece, and we want you out. And here I now was, as someone who was trusted by everyone just one week earlier, having taken accountability for what had happened and the mistake that the team had made, which was on my watch, and now I had lost everything within one week in terms of the trust through my conduct. And what happened was Pete went off for his uh, celebration meal, and I was there trying to work out what to do, and I got a team around, and I said, what are we going to do? And they said to me, you're going to have to have a revote." And I went looking for Pete, and I found Pete, and I found Alex, and I said, I've made a really bad mistake. This is what happened. We're going to have to have a revote." We had a revote, and Alex won by a landslide. And Pete, one of my best friends, never spoke to me again. Take a moment. <laughs> and turn to the person next to you and tell them what you think the lesson should be from this. Have a conversation. <laughs> so, one thing for sure, whatever you thought the moral of that story is, and I will get to the point from my side as to what I saw it was, there was one thing for sure, this whole concept of trust, no matter how much we try and break it down and make it something simple, when it comes right down to the core of us actually having to make a leadership decision, it's nowhere near as simple. And we have to then balance all these different things up, which not only impact how people trust us, but how they will trust us in the future as well. There's a lot in that story which then led me on my journey, which for the next 10 years was about seeing how people are different. Why does we trust people in some ways but not in other ways? I got involved in entrepreneurship. I got involved with Talent Dynamics, with Michelle, with the corporate world. But I can tell you where it all started by was by me saying, what is it I can trust? If I can't trust myself to make the right decisions until I learn better, what is it I can trust? And I found there was one thing I can trust, which is nature. Because we do trust that the sun will come up in the morning. We do trust if a lion is sprinting towards us, it wants to eat us. <laughs> we trust these things. Nature 
is fairly predictable in terms of how we can trust it or not trust it. And so as a result of that, I started looking at the people that were looking for their clues on how we trust each other in nature. In fact, I moved my entire life so that I actually was connected up to nature. Here is where I live. This here is called the Green Village in Bali. This entire house, which I live with, in my, with, with my kids, this entire house did not even exist four years ago. And I don't mean the house didn't exist. I meant every single piece of the house didn't exist. It's built of bamboo, and the bamboo grew over the last four years from nothing, and then ended up becoming this house. Uh, this house is designed by someone called Laura Hardy. She is the daughter of John Hardy, who started up the Green School, uh, and she just won uh, two days ago from the Architectural Digest, one of the top 10 innovators in the world, as a result of this architecture. And what she's doing is she's taking nature, and she's taking the predictable parts of nature, because bamboo is predictable in a particular way, which is different from how something like uh, 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 brick is, is uh, trusted or how something like concrete is trusted. And so using natural pieces, not in a way that they can't be trusted so the building falls down, but in a way that you understand how it can be trusted. Now how do you trust a piece of material? It's something called integrity. Every piece of building material has integrity within it and when you understand the integrity of steel or you understand the integrity of glass, then you can start to work with it. So what's the integrity within ourselves that we can actually trust? In fact, this is more than just what I live in. This is the school that my children go to. This is called the Green School in Bali. And at the Green School in Bali, it all starts from one premise, which is that children's ability to learn comes down to their curiosity. And their curiosity comes down to their innate trust in their own ability to learn. You take that away, and the curiosity ends. So as a result of that, everything we do is about making people curious, not about what they have, but where things come from. When we teach art, we don't start with the art by saying you need to have a piece of paper and you need to have paint, now create some art. Because what we do if you do that is you create dependency, which means the child can't even paint unless they have the paper or they have the paints, or they can't even get a, any money unless they go out and get a job. But if you start by saying, well, if we actually wanted paints, how would nature provide those paints to us? And you can find that you can actually make purple from beetroot, that you can actually go out and make paper from cow dung. And you make your own paper and you make your own paints. What you're now doing is you're creating self-sufficiency in the, in the eyes of the child, you're actually creating curiosity about what you can trust so that you can trust yourself. And as a result of that, you end up with something far deeper, which is a connection to your personal innate talent. And that's where talent and trust connects up. Now, I didn't find this by working in a corporation. I found this in nature. And there was someone out there that I became very fascinated with uh, as a result of all the things that we were doing in Bali, this whole idea of learning from nature. And this man, his name is Buckminster Fuller. And Buckminster Fuller, he had this concept about 30 years ago called the final exam. Uh, and the way he saw it was that all the grand challenges we have, whether it's getting on in the office, whether it is how do we go about solving poverty, he saw them all as distribution issues. He says there's already enough of everything. The only thing is we haven't distributed it effectively yet. And really, we're in the final exam. We're either going to use technology and our own ability to connect with each other to be able to resolve these issues, or we're not. And there's one thing that's in the way of us resolving them today which is our consciousness. So the real question in the final exam is will we have our consciousness accelerate and catch up with our technology and our tools and our ability to solve these problems, in which case of course we'll solve them when we pass the exam, or are we going to instead have technology and our changes continue to accelerate beyond our consciousness so that effectively we destroy ourselves? And that's why it's the final exam. I became quite haunted by this idea and I decided to dedicate my life to looking for tools that will allow us to raise our consciousness, to be able to see things differently. And that's really where talent dynamics comes from. It's about the fact that we don't have to just say we trust someone or we don't. There's a particular part in someone we can always trust because that's their nature, their true nature. And nature we can always trust. So from here, we can break this down and say that one of the things that you heard earlier, uh, which is all about, uh, Richard talked about this in terms of this idea of, uh, of nature and the cells in the body. Why is it that there are seven billion people on the planet and somehow we can't get on with each other when there's a hundred trillion cells in our body and they get on just fine? <laughs> What's going on? What's the difference? If you get down to the core of a cell to say, is the cell there to compete with the other cells? Is the cell there to kind of like prove that it's the best cell in the body? Or is it there for another reason? We realize that a cell has three functions which every cell just innately knows. The first function of a cell is contribution is to what extent is this cell actually of value to the body? Because guaranteed, the moment that cell is not of value to the body, the body will eject that cell. It will die. The second thing is sustainability. Is the cell able to look after itself? Does it have integrity in itself? Because the moment it actually breaks, the moment it actually uh, uh, ends up 
becoming low in integrity, it ends up also getting rejected, even if it's still trying to contribute to the body. And the third part is growth, replication, that one cell will create more cells. So this is about saying that there is a very fundamental way to create sustainability as ourselves in a team, as a team in an organization, and it's by just taking the example of a cell to say that the cell only is of any relevance in context to the whole. And just as you heard earlier, when we're talking about this idea that we're not here just for ourselves, but we're here for something bigger, and that this concept of trust as an evolutionary imperative, that is our not just right or just our opportunity, but our obligation to be able to actually connect with trust, we can actually measure it as a result of these three things. So one of the things that within Talent Dynamics has come about, and I'm gonna be coming back to my earlier story at the end of sharing this, is that there are three levels generally within an organization that we understand. There's of course more, but at the most simplistic level, there's the organization itself, there's the teams in the organization, and then there are the individuals. And while for a lot of us, we're focused at how does the organization get trusted by the market, well, often the organization employs not because of its trust of the market, but the departments within the organization not trusting each other, or the individuals within a team not trusting each other. And then the whole thing implodes for exactly the same reason that a part of the body might end up needing some repair work because the cells stop working. So what is this here? This here is the primary purpose that we came down to about five, six years ago when we were working with corporations, the primary purpose of a corporation. It's not there to make profit, it's not there just to make a social impact, it's there to add value to the body it serves and to leverage that value to others profitably. That an organization is just a cell within our society. And it actually comes down to this Definition here, the primary purpose of an enterprise is to add value to the market it serves and to leverage the value of others profitably, which means the partners in the market, the stakeholders in the market, if you're not leveraging their value, being of value on your own is still gonna mean that you're gonna get ejected. What do we call this? We call it something which is a responsibility, but not just any kind of responsibility, a social responsibility. And in this case, a corporate social responsibility. So we're linking the idea of talent dynamics and trust to CSR. And we then get to the next level, which is that in one area is something that you can actually measure. And we have measures, and I'll show you how we measure that within a company and how a company then shares with the rest of the world. We then also have it at the team level. Now, when you actually take this idea of us judging the performance of the sales team and how it relates to the finance team, not from the point of view of are they hitting their sales targets, where too often in a company, the sales team will hit their sales targets but not trust the finance team to let them be flexible enough in the sales they're making. So as a result, there's a divide. Or the finance team will not trust the sales team to complete all the paperwork properly. So as a result, there's also this friction that takes place. So rather than just saying, well, everyone's doing their own function, so let's just try and get on by not getting on, we start by saying, well, if the whole point of you being here is to be trusted by others and leveraging others, it means that in the sales team, the best thing you can do is to get someone on the team that actually allows you to be reliable enough so that the finance team actually trusts you. And vice versa, someone in the finance team that actually is able to be flexible enough to be able to actually work with the sales team so that the sales team trusts the finance team. And when we've seen that happen, both sides have gone and multiplied their ability to be able to be effective within the organization in ways they wouldn't by just focusing at whatever their departmental purpose is. So this as a result is about saying that the only way you can actually measure trust is not by saying, am I trustworthy? It's by actually looking outside and asking other people, are you trustworthy? And that's why all of the assessments we have are not self-assessments other than talent dynamics tests. After that, they're all 360s. They're all reflective assessments. And so from here, we then get down to the individual, which in exactly the same way, whenever anyone loses their job, or whenever anyone is in danger of losing their job, is for exactly the same reason. They have ceased to be of value to the team or to leverage the values of the others in the team profitably. And when you realize that, you can actually repair that to begin with and already find ways that they can be effective. These three levels we measure, and that's all part of talent dynamics. And it brings me to the reason we measure them. Why is this even necessary? Would this have been helpful when I was back 25 years ago and had Rory and Pete by my side? Would this have been valuable to me to not have actually made the mistakes in the first place? Talent dynamics is not a cure, it's a prevention. It allows you to actually make the best decisions to begin with by understanding the true nature of who we are. And this here is something which is not my words, it's something that goes back some 2,000 years, because you can find it in the Bible, and it's called the parable of the talents, and it's where the whole word talent comes from, because talent is a measure of gold. Talent is a measure of gold, and this idea here that gold is something that has a value and something that we all have inside ourselves allows us to see through the parable of the talents what, in this parable, 
the whole purpose of having this talent is. And I just kind of like, if you haven't heard of this, uh, I love the languaging of it. It's, uh, it's, it's not modern day language, but I think it's kind of interesting, and you've probably heard some of these words before. The whole story here is that there is a master who leads on a journey. He has eight talents, coincidentally, uh, and he gives them to his three servants. He spreads them out, and he says, uh, look after this and see if you can make more from it. He comes back. It turns out that two of the servants, and I'm just kind of like speeding up the story here, but two of the servants, they went out and they invested it. They found ways to make the talent bigger. The third one was like, oh, I don't want to lose this talent, so ended up burying the talent so that that way he wouldn't lose the talent. And when the, servant, when the master came back, he went to the two who had grown their talents, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So, of course, they were very happy. As for the third one, who thought he'd done a good thing by hiding the talent and looking after it, he said to him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I didn't sow and gather where I didn't scatter. You ought, therefore, to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received back my own with interest. Take away, therefore, the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who doesn't have, even that which he has will be throw out the unprofitable servant into the utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> <sighs> Sitting on that bench, I know the feeling. <laughs> so this is not about you having a talent inside yourself where there's an opportunity to use it. It's about you having a talent inside where you have an obligation to use it. And you have an obligation to use the talents within each person in your team in the same way that a teacher at Green School has as part of their job description to be able to find the gold in every one of those children. Because within that core of who we are is the core of where our success in life will be and our contribution and our self-worth while we're here on this planet. This is more than simply just how do we make our business more effective. It's about seeing your business as a crucible for the rising of the human spirit. Now, if we take that idea and we say, well, what does that look like? There is an equation. And the equation here allows me to go into the mechanics of this. So it's not just some nice words. There is a fundamental way to actually turn meaning into measure, that you can actually structure it. And here is the equation. Talent equals value times leverage. So what does that mean? You all saw it in the reports. You've all done your profile. What that means is, it means that if you were to think of a river, where a river has height differential, the river will have a speed of flow based on however high that river is or whatever the gradient is. So in the same way that there is that flow which moves, there's also the flow of information, the flow of communication, frankly, the flow of all resources that will move from high value to low value. Wherever it exists, it will then flow onto other areas. And so as a result of that, when you have value and you flow it, it attracts others to you. So you can always tell value because it has attraction. And when you actually have someone trying to sell a product and everyone goes to someone else's product, you know where they actually value the product because it's wherever they're getting attracted. So that's pretty simple. But there's a second part which is while that river might have a gradient, it also has a width, which is not the speed of resource flow, it's the, it's the volume of resource flow. And that's where leverage comes in. When we leverage each other, we can end up becoming far more effective as a team than if we're just trying to use our own value. The challenge with this is that there are two opposites to value and two opposites to leverage, and yours are one of them. Everyone try this for a moment, just fold your arms, fold your arms. Okay, so you just did something naturally. You probably didn't even think about it. You just folded your arms. But if you look around to your left and right and look at how other people are folding their arms and see if they're folding the same way as you or different, you might notice some people are the opposite to you. Okay, all right, on the count of three, everyone do the opposite. One, two, three. <laughs> yes, right. Yes. So uh, half, the people, half the people in the room are like, okay, one, two, three. <laughs> You're going back the same way. Right, but some of you have done the opposite. If you're doing the opposite, does it feel more natural? No. No. Okay, shake it out. Shake it out. An opposite is something that by doing it, it precludes the opposite. You can't do both at the same time. If you're high, you can't be low. If you're left, you can't be right. The whole key point here, and this is all going back to the I Ching 5,000 years ago. Why would I go back to the I Ching 5,000 years ago? Because that was the Chinese book called the Book of Changes, where the Chinese spent several thousand years just studying nature. In fact, if you have done any psychometric test, there's a large part of the psychometric test of the 20th and 21st century that came from the work of Carl Jung. And Carl Jung, he came with a lot of those ideas after he happened to meet 
with one person who came back from the East, his name is Richard Wilhelm, in the, in the year 1919, and he came back with this book called the I Ching that had been translated in German in the first time. Kagan was looking for his own structure, and when he actually then sat and really understood what the Chinese had worked out, which is that there are seasons and that there's actually a natural talent within each of us, he took those concepts, he turned it into intuitive and, and sensory and extrovert and introvert and all those other things that you see, derivatives of it like MBTI or, um, or disk profiling and others, all came from that base and from a book which uh, Carl Jung came out with, Psychological Types, which came out after he published the I Ching in the West. So as a result of that, we have this cycle which allows us to see there's a yin and yang to everything. And within us, we have that as well. There's two opposites to value. And when you're in one, then it actually feels natural. Most of us, we take our talents for granted because we're just doing it and we expect other people to do the same. We're good with people, we're just creative. And what do we really do is we spend our time focusing at the negative. So here's the thing. If we actually break this down and we actually look at these three areas, we can see that talent, which is all about the social responsibility that we have and which actually shows up through sustainability, is linked to value which is where people trust us, because trust, you will always trust someone not because they did something right once, because they consistently do it again and again. When they actually say they're gonna have a promise and then deliver a promise, it doesn't mean you have ongoing trust. But if they have a river of promises, you trust that river is always gonna provide. So this is about actually saying, what's the one area that I just sustainably deliver on all the time, because it's just natural to me, instead of something I have to work hard at, where it doesn't feel natural, and then I just fail at the moment when everyone is expecting the most from me. And then leverage is the fact that we then have a way to actually increase that flow. And these actually link into very direct measures. When we do something called our taster session, when any organization, whether it's a small company, whether it's a large organization, will spend an afternoon, a couple of hours with the leadership team, and will explain this in such a way that the leadership team can look and identify the value, the nuggets of gold that have been hidden inside their organization. It might be a particular product. It might be a particular uh, 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 a repeating, recurring product or partnership which by them just actually turning that on would double up their revenues. And similarly in terms of flow, by them actually figuring out how to do more with less, by actually linking in with others already in their organization, they could actually double that leverage and double their profits within there as well. So these are the two things, the revenues and profits, which allows us to have measurable change where then someone looks at that and says, I can see exactly how I can make that extra, extra amount of money. And I'll give you some examples in a moment of what happens there uh, as a result of looking at this concept of trust and flow. Take it one step further which is that we have opposites. So we have the people who are the dynamo energies. Hands up who are the creators and stars and mechanics in the room. Okay, wow, quite a lot of people. This is the intuitive, in the innovative thinking, right? This is head in the clouds. Naturally, head in the, you've been that way all your life. People probably thought you were kind of a bit scatterbrained, always starting new things, never finishing things, always expecting everyone to keep up and they never do and you blame them. And this, is, this is like always getting things started. There's someone like Richard Branson, he's a creator profile, which is up the top. He's head in the clouds. Uh, someone like uh, Warren Buffett is the opposite. Warren Buffett doesn't create anything at all. And he's, uh, he's, he's got his ear to the ground. There are leaders who are on both sides there. And understanding that allows us to see that intuitive thinking, which is head in the clouds, which is innovative thinking, that creates one of the opposites of value, which is we're going to innovate our way there. As opposed to timing, which is service, which is tempo, which is ear to the ground, which is the opposite. Hands up who we have here who are the deal makers and the traders and the accumulators. Who do we have? Okay, great. So every time, every time you are asked to go out and create some new plan in some new way, you'd much rather have some conversation with people to actually see what's working now. You're going to be much more like a sprinkler seeing the peripheral vision as opposed to the, to the perpendicular vision. As, as opposed to seeing depth of vision, you have breadth of vision. So it's a very, very different way of looking at things. Now, by the way, this might sound obvious when I share it, but even countries don't get this. Singapore, I just came from Singapore. The Singapore government is trying to get everyone to be more creative because they keep on getting criticized for not being creative enough. It's the second most competitive country in the world, and they're trying to get everyone creative. But let me ask you, was Singapore made successful as a creative nation or as a trading nation? A trading nation. In fact, if you look at all the wealthiest people and all of the uh, uh, um, organizations that are being successful, they're doing it in timing and in service. I flew here on Singapore Airlines. Believe me, when you're on Singapore Airlines, you get that Singapore understands service. The last time I came, I was on British Airways. But that's okay, the service wasn't quite the same, but I wouldn't expect it to be because England is not a, tr a tempo trading nation. England is a creative nation. 
Is it true? It's full of amazing geniuses that just have the most incredible inventions that get stolen by the Japanese. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a whole different, and every nation, in the same way as every company, has got a different, like Apple is an innovative company. You don't expect it to have all the best services you need it to have because it has innovative products. So we all are trusted in a particular area which is natural to us. The same we have those who are steel energy. Hands up who, who are accumulator and lords uh, and mechanics in the room. Who do we have? Okay, great. So these are the people who are much more on the uh, leveraging side, which is, as, as well as you have value, and, uh, uh, which is all about your thinking dynamic, which is intuitive for sensory, you also have your action dynamic, because this is all about thoughts to action. It's all about dreams to reality. And the action dynamic is either when you are system-based, where you're like, I'm much more introvert in the way that I act, so as a result, I'm going to look for a way to do it simpler and make many. Whereas those people who are on the other side, on the blaze side, which is the side which is people-based, they don't know how to make things simple. In fact, they can't help but make things complicated. There's people, hands up, who are the stars and the supporters and the deal makers in the room? Wow, okay, right? These are the people that just love meeting people. So if you've got someone on the other side, you've got to go out and you've got to meet people. No, go send someone out who loves meeting people. So everyone who just put their hands up, they just love meeting, they'll meet everyone today. They just love meeting people. In fact, every week they'll go for the week just loving meeting people. They'll get to the end of the week after meeting all these people and they'll still have no idea why they met all those people. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so this is where we actually get down to this idea that every one of these has within it a different value and leverage in how they actually create their, ta their, their talent. A creator is very creative because of that. They have a way to create their flow. Uh, a star is someone who is actually able to build much more on brand and to market things effectively in the team. A mechanic is very good with the systems, but don't need to go send them on the marketing side if you have the right person out there creating the system to replicate. A lord is very good with the cash flows. I will always make sure that my finance guy is on the lord side, and then you've got the supporters who are brilliant at leadership. People like Jack Welsh is a leader who actually is out there with the people. Traders are very good at service. You've got the deal makers who are extremely good at actually going out and making the connections. And then you've got the accumulators who are actually very good at project management or actually being able to analyze both the what and the, uh, both the how and the when. And the reason is because every one of these steps also has what, who, when, how. They have a question behind it. There's a seasonality to it. Uh, this is the one uh, psychometric test which actually connects to the seasons of an industry, to the four steps within a business, which is always about form and then storm, and then norm, and then perform, and they actually fit around those four seasons, so you have different people that would lead the team at different times, depending on where you are within the business, and then of course you have the fifth element, which is not the what, which is those people at the top always ask what, it's not the who, which is very much for the extroverts, it's not the when, which is the timing, or the how, which is very easily answered by those who are more on the steel side, it's the why, which is why would you be doing it in the first place. Now, and this is the culture side, this is the whole, idea that every single organization has to have a reason that all the cells are collaborating towards something. Given my time, I'm not going to go through all of this other than to say that there are five levels of trust where when you actually go through our 360, and we have a 360 assessment, you can go through these five levels and actually say, it's not about whether I trust someone or not, it's whether I trust them in a particular area. If I had this when I was captain of the boat club and I had taken Rory through this, I would have found that he was very highly trusted with people he was at a very low level of trust on the detail. I would not have given him the job of going to put in that document in the first place. So we wouldn't have had that issue in the first place. I would have found that I'm extremely good on the innovation side, but I'm not the best at enrolling or recruiting. I would not have been the one who was standing there trying to persuade people to make the right decision of who should be their next captain. We put ourselves in places where we're not trusted and then wonder why we lose our trust as a result of that. And that was my lesson after 15 years of just studying human behavior through nature. And there's also five levels of trust which links to our flow, so that we have initiative, respect, we have uh, tempo, which is presence, we have discipline, we have perseverance. This, these are all measured within something we have which is called a PSR 360 barometer. All of the things I'm sharing here, which is that you have an opportunity, and this is something that you uh, hear, I'm, so, I'm sure some of you who come for a lunch event, that if you actually wanted to have a program uh, where you're going through this process with your team, whether you're a small team, whether you've got a big team, uh, to actually look at how you can make this work. Uh, the program is called a taster session. It costs about a thousand pounds or so. Is it hands up who here would be interested in bringing some of this to your organization if we brought one of our team members and if it was totally free of charge? It costs you nothing to do it. Can I see a show of hands who would have? Okay, thank you. Well, let's do that, right? That's my, that's my gift to you. That's my offer to you with Michelle is that for everyone who is interested, we'll give out a, a, shall we give out a sheet now? Is that a good idea? We'll give out a sheet now that allows you to actually fill that out with your details so that you can have a proper personalized session here with your team 
We'll do it up to 10 people, which means we even give you 10 of the talent dynamics profiles for your team members as well. And then we'll organize the time that works for you so that you can then basically have this opportunity to understand how this all works for your organization at no cost, right? We'll just do it as a way and as a thank you for you being here. Does that sound like a good deal? All right, okay. Okay, let's, uh, let, 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 let's not give it to everyone because I think, uh, do we have enough for everyone? Do, we got enough for everyone? Okay, we're gonna pass them out so everyone has them. And then uh, what's the best way? We'll get, uh, if you want to do this, fill it out and then pass it to, uh, to the back of the room at the end of my little session, which I'm about to complete on, all right? Okay, how am I doing on time, Mike? Uh, you're good. Well, okay, I've got another two minutes, right? Yeah, two minutes. Okay, great. So, uh, so let, me, let me complete, as those are being handed out, uh, let me complete with the fact that when you start to measure in the area that you are strongest in, and you find out where those around you are strongest, we have that ability to now lift up our entire team, and we have the ability to actually get everything working the way it should be. Here is one final point for those of you who end up taking one of these programs and just experiencing it for yourself. When you get to a point where you really realize, as you were hearing earlier, that there are environments which create trust, you might want to come out and visit me at my resort in Bali, where we have actually organized five different high-performance areas. So every time I get into creativity, I have a different area for my creative space. There was a time when we all sat in cubicles, wondering why we're not creative. Then there's a time when we're all in open plan offices, why we, asking why we couldn't concentrate. The bottom line is that you should have five different environments within your organization where one of them is a space where you can be trusted to get things done. There's another space where you can be trusted to get on the phone. Another one where you can be trusted to be brainstorming. And most importantly, the one that most of us missed, which is called the bridge, which is the spirit of your organization, a place where you can be trusted to truly look at the future and collaborate for the big purpose as to why you're there in the first place. So we have got all the tools and examples of how you design these spaces to turn your entire organization into five high-performing spaces and then scheduling everything around those energies so that you actually get in every element the trust. We all know what happens. You go to a library and guess what happens? You realize that the library, everyone goes quiet without even having to worry about it. No one's gonna dance in the library. But you go to a dance hall or a dance club and everyone's dancing. And just by being in the right environment, you immediately get to the space where you can be trusted or the team can be trusted as well. Those are the three different steps uh, that you can be involved in. The first one is just an introduction by just doing the talent dynamics, you've got that introduction. The third, second one is the one that those of you who fill out that form and give it to us will actually get you onto the step two, which is just going through the, the, the change that you can now go through with the taster sessions. Uh, and then the step three is if you decide you wanna go all the way through. Uh, I've gone over time, so I'm now going to just speed up through these ones. This is all, uh, we're gonna be giving out the, um, the slides to everybody. Uh, we could do that, right? So these slides here, this, all these things that we're now doing within Talent Dynamics, if these things are things that uh, you find interesting, uh, we'll post up these slides in a way that you can get to them, maybe on the LinkedIn page, something like that. Uh, the organizations that we, have, uh, that we have worked with, there's many around the world now. As Michelle said, we're in 16 different countries. Uh, and it's pretty much all by referral and word of mouth where we have got a large number of uh, consultants who are working with us on all of this as well. So that's pretty much about where we are now as an organization. But like I said at the beginning, for me it was all about the why. And that's what I'm gonna finish on right now. Yay talents. That there are eight talents. That we all have one of them. And for me, while I was there on the boat, and I was there kind of seeing myself as one of those talents, I think what inspired me the most was something that I read on the tombstone of the person I mentioned earlier, Buckminster Fuller. Because he's not talking about being on the boat. What he's talking about is the rudder which steers the boat. He has on his tombstone three words, call me trim tab. And as you can see here, he says a large ship goes by and then comes the rudder. On the edge of the rudder is a miniature rudder called a trim tab. Moving the trim tab builds a low pressure which turns the rudder that steers a gigantic ship with almost no effort. One individual can be a trim tab, making a major difference. That moment when I was in Cambridge and I was on the boat and I was rocking and I was holding on for dear life, I made that decision for me which was, well maybe I just gotta jump overboard, see where we're heading, become that little trim tab where just by making those little adjustments, we can make huge differences in the world. Every one of you are here today with that same opportunity of being a trim tab. 
and changing the future direction of this planet for all of us. Thank you. Hey. Oh.